when we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. <laughs> Audrey Tang, Digital Minister of Taiwan, is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Audrey is a civil, civic hacker and Taiwan's digital minister in charge of social innovation, is known for revitalizing global open source communities such as Perl and Haskell, Audrey served on Taiwan National Development Council Open Data Committee and K-12 Curriculum Committee and, and led the country's first e-rulemaking project prior to joining the cabinet. Audrey was a consultant with Apple on computational linguistics with Oxford University Press on crowd lexicography and with social text on social interaction design. Taiwan's digital minister uh, has made the 2019 list of 100 global thinkers published by Foreign Policy magazine. She has leapt into prom prominence in Japan for creating an app that combats coronavirus by showing face mask inventory levels at a glance. In 2016, she became Taiwan's youngest ever government minister at the age of 35. Recently, she was wowed with Japan and the rest of the world with her leadership on the coronavirus crisis. I am so honored and blessed to have you here. Thank you so much for being here, Audrey. Welcome to the show. Yeah, uh, good local time, everyone. Yes, it's a it's morning for me. I'm in Hamburg, Germany. It's eight o'clock, and, and you're in Taiwan, so we've mm -hmm. got quite a distance. But I really appreciate you finding the time to come and speak with us today. I'm going to dive right into it because we don't have a lot of time because I, you have a extremely busy schedule. But I want you to catch us up to speed. How have you been during this crazy time since uh, actually December 2019? Um, until present, where we've seen all sorts of things. Have you had some resilience? How have you weathered all this thing around the world? Not just COVID, but Black Lives Matter, so racial inequality, and all sorts of other craziness going on around the world. Um, we're quite peaceful here, actually. Um, it's been uh, more than half a year uh, since we um, relaxed the uh, pandemic, counter-pandemic rules. Of course, um, we're not like perfect. It's been seven deaths uh, so far in the past year or so. Uh, but it's safe to say that Taiwan has countered the pandemic uh, without resorting to lockdowns. Uh, and the other one um, that you mentioned, the infodemic or the polarization and things like that online. Again, I think we countered without any uh, administrative takedowns. Um, and so I wouldn't say we're, we're completely peaceful uh, here. Um, we do still wear a mask, keep social distance, wash our hands until vaccination. Uh, but otherwise, uh, the people don't panic. Uh, there was no chaos uh, as we did actually in 2003 when SARS, uh, that's the precursor to COVID-19, has hit Taiwan. That was pretty chaotic and everyone above 30 years so remembers that. Uh, and in 2004, we resorted to, you know, uh, put in the legislative and the technological institutions to make sure when SARS comes again, uh, we do not um, panic and that uh, paid this time. So there, there's a, a bunch of things already there that, and, and that's why I'm so glad you're on the shows because I want to dive right into those. In 2003 with SARS and also precursor MERS and 
Um, there was all sorts of things that kind of rocked uh, Taiwan and, and Asia in general. And you guys were well prepared. You knew something could be coming and you were, you were very well prepared. But there's a story behind Dr. Willan. Uh, and, and Wuhan, and I'd like you to tell that and kind of how you were able to quickly react and, and dive into that with preparedness. Definitely. So um, Dr. Li Wenliang uh, from Wuhan, this time around, posted um, a year ago, around December 30s or so, on their social media that there were, and I quote, seven new SARS cases, uh, unquote. Now, his message did not reach the people of Wuhan in general, uh, but they uh, did reach people in Taiwan. So Dr. Liu Wenliang quite literally saved uh, the Taiwanese people because there was a young doctor, the name's No More Pipe, uh, a nickname, on Taiwan's equivalent of Reddit or the PTT, who cross-posted Dr. Liu Wenliang's message and people upvoted it. So after the upvoting, the medical officers uh, in the Center for Disease Control noticed it. So the very next day, um, January the 1st, 2020, we started health inspections for all flight passengers coming in from Wuhan and we set up the central um, command center for the disease control and so on so-called CECC central epidemic command center even before we had the first local case um, and so these two uh, taken together made sure that we didn't panic but rather responded in a very orderly fashion something that we run yearly drills since SARS uh, that prepared us for now the PTT is very interesting because it's not a private company it's actually Actually, uh, digital public infrastructure is run by the social sector, namely the National Taiwan University. Um, its entire operating expense is probably subsidized by the National University education budget and so on. And the governance is open source. The entire uh, website and the uh, the bulletin board system was open source. So because of that, uh, it doesn't serve the advertiser's interest or the shareholder's interest, but are much more interested in issues uh, with public impact, such as Dr. Lee Wenlau's message. That is so beautiful to hear, and that, that was quickly. There are some other things in there that my listeners <clears throat> probably don't know, and I want to I want to touch on them. Because of uh, the open government and your upvoting, you have, you have a system that uses social innovation, social media, and technology to um, <clears throat> not to reply or negatively post or get into debates about things, but upvoting mm -hmm. like or dislike, so to say. And, and That's right. I'd like you to kind of go more into that, how, how uh, instead of getting in, into debates or controversy or rumors or conspiracies, it's more like uh, data that you collect through this upvoting process, which quickly can say, is that a legitimate concern? Do we need to react to that? If you could take us a little bit deeper into this system, and it's one that you created, correct? Or was it, it wasn't around before you started? Well, it's, it's definitely a team effort. I mean, yes. the mask availability map that was uh, Howard Wu and Finchen Kiang from Tainan City. My role is more like an amplifier uh, to make sure that all the different stakeholders are aware of these civic technologies. So um, you can say that I'm a connector between the civic tech on one side and gov tech government technologists on the other uh, but definitely it's not my uh, sole um, work that's not the case yes. there's like literally thousands of people on both sides of these things now uh, yeah so the upvoting I think that's uh, quite crucial because uh, we have a very interesting system called the join system join the gov the tw uh, it's a combination of petition like we the people in the US um, regulatory pre-announcement like regulation.gov, uh, participatory budget, where there's no equivalent, uh, yeah, and many yeah. other things, right? Uh, and so it's roll in one, uh, but people on those uh, pro-social social media arrangements like participatory budgeting and e-petition, um, we designed the space very carefully so that people do see, for example, you may want to consider this petition if you have joined that petition, but there is uh, the two columns uh, beneath all the petition topics. One is for the supporting um, ideas and one is for the 
the uh, ideas that um, may not support the petition. But there's no way to reply across the two columns. That is to say, there's upvote, there's downvote, there's posting your ideas, but there's no way to address some commenter by name. And quite interestingly, once we take away the reply button, uh, the trolls cannot grow. Uh, we see much more uh, nuances and much more eclectic deliberations between people's ideas rather than uh, just um, attacking each other, the personal attacks and so on, which may be good to sell advertisements, but uh, definitely does not belong in digital public infrastructure. So. We call these spaces, such as the joint platform, pro-social media, uh, whereas the more anti-social part of the social media does not apply here. So there's a, a couple of things that have emerged over the years. One is the Copenhagen letter. The other is the Center for Humane Technology from Tristan Harris and, and, and those who are kind of trying to bring humanity back into technology and, and um, a lot of our digital twins, so to say, are being used against us to sell our data and, and so on. And so I really like the fact that 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 uh, the government is set up so that your social innovation is set up in this way. And I want to dive a little bit more into that later uh, as we get further into the discussion. But this sets us up to a unique time. I think it couldn't have been a better uh, time for us to meet because... There was something very similar that happened on January 6th that kind of uh, uh, happened at the Capitol in the United States. I'm in Germany, but, uh, but I'm an American. And um, it was a different type of kind of interference with Congress and things. But in 2004, I believe it was, you guys occupied uh, 2014. 2014, 14. sorry. Yeah. 2014. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you were among others who occupied Parliament, and mm -hmm. I would I'd like to hear more a little bit about the behind the scenes, what happened and transpired. Mm -hmm. I I make an assumption, uh, but I'd like it to hear it from you. I I don't think there was guns involved and and flags. No, it and was all sorts thoroughly nonviolent. Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, yeah, the um, Sunflower Movement in 2014 March uh, was three weeks uh, of peaceful demonstration um, in the occupied parliament, but demonstration is uh, in a sense of a demo, not as a protest, uh, as uh, showing how it is actually possible to deliberate a quite complicated trade agreement the CSSTA, or cross Strait Service and Trade Agreements with Beijing, uh, while the parliament were refusing to deliberate it substantially, uh, people from more than 20 NGOs each uh, deliberated uh, their particular aspect. It could be about human rights, it could be about labor conditions, small and medium enterprises, environmental impact, cybersecurity, uh, and, and so on, on the CSSTA. And we managed to get rough consensus uh, after three weeks of live, live streamed um, deliberation with half a million people on the street and many more online. And those were ratified by the head of the parliament. So a little bit different from other jurisdictions. Uh, and uh, the Occupy was a success. Um, so one of the aspects, for example, talks about whether Beijing uh, components of the then new 4G infrastructure uh, could be considered, quote, private sector, unquote. And the rough consensus was no, there was no pure play private sector in the Beijing regime because if they want, they can disappear company leadership. They can install party branches uh, within those large enterprises and so on. So we should not actually uh, treat them as private sector, but should instead run a systemic risk analysis every time there is a upgrade or in time there's a kind of firmware um, um, update on security issues and so on. But amortized, this will be more expensive than we... Um, if we have gone with Ericsson or Nokia or other vendors. So the rough consensus was that, no, we're not going to allow Beijing components in our then new 4G infrastructure. So that's just one out of maybe 100 topics deliberated on the street. But you can see in the past couple of years, many other jurisdictions are now having the same conversation around 5G this time, but essentially the same arguments. And so, uh, did for that three week period, did you actually sleep in in the parliament? Were you guys there mm -hmm. twenty four seven for that whole time? Mm -hmm. and, and, oh wow, okay. And so now you were kind of seen as someone who's bringing in cap five cables and keeping the mm -hmm. internet and other other things. How, mm -hmm. how, 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 did that lead to the 
request for you to be part of the ministerium and yeah. help out? That's right. So uh, once uh, we set up the high speed uh, fiber optic connection uh, and Ethernet connection of the occupied area, I wasn't like figuratively speaking, I wasn't there physically, but I'm there um, in my spirit. <laughs> that is to say, uh, I watched the live streams and helped setting up the live stream uh, for each and every NGOs that participated in the deliberation and the real time transcripts uh, and things like that, that would enable a conversation that's actually fruitful that moves forward by um, kind of diverging a little bit uh, during the day and converging a little bit uh, during the night and the next day we can uh, talk a little bit more about more nuances rather than having the same conversation like literally every day as we see in some other Occupy movements um, and so that's uh, my role uh, but again it's not just myself but rather like literally hundreds of civic hackers. Now um, after that the cabinet uh, reshuffle a little bit um, at the end of 2014, all the mayoral candidates that supported open government and the Occupy movement gets elected, sometimes uh, surprisingly even to themselves, uh, and people who did not um, support this did not get elected. So the uh, newly uh, reassembled cabin around the end of that year decided to work with young uh, reverse mentors, uh, the facilitators, the enablers of the Occupy uh, by working with um, the people, no longer just for the people, uh, I was then invited um, as a consultant uh, for a project by, run by the uh, minister of the cabinet at the time. So around the end of 2014, I started working with the Korea Public Service and personally trained maybe a thousand or so Korea Public Servants in the art of listening at scale. So uh, you, you're very much to me a, a global citizen. I've heard you speak Japanese, I've heard you speak mm -hmm. some German. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably, I'm busy. I'm busy. Yeah, I'm busy. And you, 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 you speak a, a couple languages, and and you, you do you. I guess you're ha, had a lot to do with linguistics, computer linguistics as well, mm -hmm. and um, so I, I love that. But I want to start out with a question: Do you consider yourself to be a global citizen, and how would you feel? Mm -hmm about a world without borders, divisions, nations, and separating huma mm -hmm. humanity one from another. Mm -hmm. Well, I consider myself a uh, homo sapiens. Uh, my community is that of the homo sapiens community. Now, um, whether that's global, I guess, I mean, Mars is also a globe, I guess, but is International <laughs> Space Station a globe? <laughs> so, yeah. um, so, so I guess it's more than global, right? Uh, this is basically saying I don't have in my mind uh, this binary division that says uh, some part of humanity is closer to me, some part is farther away from me. I think uh, I just uh, belong to one very large community, and that is the Homo sapiens community. I love that. Uh, Taiwan is really 23.5 million people, and their broadband is a human right. You know, mm -hmm. everybody's got access to, to, to broadband, high-speed mm -hmm. transportation, and these mm -hmm. social innovations and digital services to enable them to not only to, to have, have a government that's open and transparent, but to have a voice, a seat at the table, what more can you kind of tell us on how that formed? Was that there before you got in as a minister? And how have you kind of pushed to make this open data charter open by default and these type of things to push those forward in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was a young child, there was already this idea that public telephone communication uh, is a human right. Uh, and after that, internet is human rights. But in the past four years, we've upgraded to say broadband is a human right, meaning this is not just about downloading speed, but also uplink uh, as well. Because without the uplink, you can't really voice your concerns. You can only um, download what other people have to say, like radio and television. So anywhere in Taiwan, when you're guaranteed to have 10 megabits per second, both ways actually, at just um, 16 US dollars per month, uh, unlimited data. Uh, otherwise, it's my fault, like personally. Um, and so we've upgraded on previous 
promises and made it much more symmetric. The other contribution uh, that I made along with people from the K-12 uh, basic education curriculum is that instead of media literacy or data literacy, uh, we now teach uh, media competence uh, or data competence and digital competence. Uh, the difference is literacy is when you are a consumer of information and competence is when you are a producer. Now, uh, the primary schoolers are perfectly capable of setting up like air boxes, the inexpensive measurements uh, devices of air quality and share it to a distributed ledger. Uh, and if you do so, uh, previously unteachable concepts such as GDPR, data stewardship, joint controllership and so on become that much easier uh, to teach and to show because people um, like very young people are now also data stewards and uh, they can also participate in the fact checking efforts of our presidential deliberations and platform and debates um, and learn how to balance the different viewpoints, how to check your sources, how to be factual and things like that. Uh, again, as media producers and not just media listeners and consumers and so on. Um, and so I would say open data and so on uh, grows out of the civic engagement um, initiatives that uh, see even very young people uh, not yet at the age of voting still uh, very fruitful as contributors to the governance and once they are of the age to vote they understand democracy not just as uploading three bits of information per person every four years which is called voting by the way uh, but uh, actually <laughs> can participate uh, in uh, petitions sandbox application presidential hackathon participatory budgeting and so on which are much more continuous day-to-day -day democracy you, you've touched on several things in there, and I need you to go even deeper and explain them for my listeners. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> every year there's a presidential hackathon. You, mm -hmm. You've addressed that. There's mm -hmm. also a, a sandbox and, and the mm -hmm. fork type of governance mm -hmm. zero, mm -hmm. a, as well as airbox. And so mm -hmm. there's, there's a couple of things, but I would like you to go deeper and explain a little bit more about mm -hmm. those. But in particular, when uh, uh, I know enough to be dangerous about your airbox system, which is air, mm -hmm. air quality sensors and, That's and right. data and monitoring. Mm -hmm. uh, but I believe there's a close tie to that and COVID, uh, airborne and uh, mm -hmm. pollution. Yes. And also um, in Taiwan, China and many places in Asia, it's common not just to wear masks for pandemics, but also because of air pollution. And so... Uh, there's a, a tradition of mask wearing. If you could address that, I would really appreciate it. Definitely. So um, as you can see, uh, we have a mask in our pockets all the time. Uh, and, and that's even before the pandemic, because uh, as you said exactly, uh, we see mask wearing as something that protects our own mouth, our own face from our own hands. That's a very different uh, from the messages that we see across other jurisdictions where the masks are built as something that I don't know, protect the elderly, uh, protect the vulnerable people and frontline workers uh, that protects others. But in our case, uh, the masks are there to protect ourselves. Um, and so very interestingly, though, those uh, appeal to rational self-interest actually made it easier to remind each other to wear a mask. Because uh, if you are not wearing a mask and I say, hey, why are you not protecting yourself? Uh, that's very natural for me to say. But if I say, uh, please wear a mask to show respect to me, that's very very difficult to say unless of course we're very good friends right um, and so uh, so quite paradoxically appealing to rational self-interest rather than any you know Confucianism or things like that made it easier for people to communicate to each other the importance of wearing masks now um, during the pandemic of course uh, we very quickly found out that the medical grade masks um, lightweight enough to be worn uh, the entire day uh, that is going to be crucial um, and the people um, really clamored for the government to ramp up the production because at the beginning of the pandemic we only had less than two million medical mask production facility per day uh, but that's um, less than one tenth of the total population but by now uh, we've increased it more than tenfold and everyone can go to a nearby pharmacy or convenience store using their national health card uh, which covers pretty much everyone it's universal and get 10 medical masks per two weeks um, at extremely affordable 
Nobel Prizes. Uh, and so I think this makes a lot of sense uh, to make sure that people who develop any symptoms, for example, can get the masks uh, at just, uh, I think it's 14 US cents uh, per mask uh, and put it on and go to a nearby clinic uh, for a full diagnosis. Um, and that's even cheaper than going to a uh, drive through test in other jurisdictions. And so that may sure that the local clinics and pharmacies uh, retain their trust. In fact, it's even more trustworthy because they participate uh, with the local people to ensure a universal mask uh, wearing culture, uh, not just top down, but rather people who remind themselves. And that in turn reduced our R value of the COVID-19 around uh, April to be under one, meaning that there's no local uh, spread ever after. We do have like from time to time, local transmissions for one person or two people people. Uh, but after that, it doesn't tend to spread because more than three quarters of people are wearing masks and washing their hands. So uh, can you also address the your presidential hackathon, mm -hmm. the sandbox sure. and fork gov mm -hmm. zero? Certainly. So um, the mask availability map that you alluded to from the very beginning uh, started by essentially forking, that is to say, taking something existing and developing it to a new direction, forking existing air maps, air box maps uh, that shows the air pollution and so on, which is why it could be developed um, in less than three days uh, since we announced the mask rationing in early February last year. Now, um, that's also informed a lot of people who want to contribute similar uh, maps, uh, but for other things, especially around climate change um, in the presidential hackathon. So every year, the president gives out five trophies to social innovation teams across the sectors. And the five winning teams receive a trophy, which is shaped like Taiwan, with a micro projector underneath the trophy. And when it turns on, uh, it projects the president uh, giving the team the trophy. So it's a meta, the self-describing trophy, and that shows the presidential promise to uh, basically deliver whatever they did in the past three months um, into the national scale deployment uh, as soon as possible, um, usually within the first year after they won the presidential hackathon. So for example, there's a um, actually not just one, but two maps uh, in last year's presidential hackathon winning teams. One shows a map uh, of the arable um, not really Arab, but plentiful lands uh, that's uh, currently owned by the government, but does not have any uh, activities. And it's using augmented reality, enable people who plan to plant together to take care of those trees together, kind of an internet of trees, uh, and make sure that people who can volunteer their time into planting and so on can work with the municipal government to get those uh, places for land um, trees planted. Now, there's also another map that shows all the areas uh, uh, near you that offers free drinking water. Uh, and it's like Pokemon Go. Uh, it's a thoroughly gamified uh, pro-social platform uh, that rewards people to, instead of buying new plastic bottles, using uh, their refillable bottles uh, to get uh, water um, from the drinking fountains. Uh, and it can also uh, publish uh, like from a notification um, for the places where people are likely to suffer from extreme heat, like heat damage and things like that to remind them to drink water um, in a timely fashion. Uh, and once you complete like a mission of 50 uh, check in every day, uh, you form a new habit and that could also be redeemed uh, to get uh, more like specialty drinks uh, from the local um, arable um, lands producers and so on. So Everything is connected together as a way to uh, build more like a solidarity economy uh, across the board uh, to reduce plastic and also to counter climate change and so on. So for all these cases that won the trophy, we make sure that within the next 12 months, we uh, take it and scale it into national scale policies. Yeah, I love that, how, how that sandbox works so that if, it, if, if it's shown to work without going through all the the red tape of governance mm -hmm. and bureaucracy <clears throat> mm -hmm. it's first uh, kind of hacked and tested and tried in the sandbox and if the data and it's proven to be effective mm -hmm. then you bypass all that it's implemented mm -hmm. and, and i really love that uh, and it's also funded by those those who uh, uh 
So it's not really funded. There's no impact to the government as far as I understand. That's right. There's no uh, monetary prize associated uh, with presidential hackathon. So if it doesn't work out, then we thank the participants. So we all learn something. But if it does work out, then the five team that did have their ideas work out basically gets the funding uh, from first the municipal government that see this as something that's proven that actually works, but also from the economic sector and the social sector who often volunteer the budget and the time, uh, respectively. So in 2018, the World Economic Forum listed Taiwan as one of the four global innovators in, mm -hmm. in the world. Um, but even before that, Taiwan has been um, um, singled out time and time again for being innovative, using social innovation for doing things in a very progressive and different manner. Most recently, like I mentioned earlier, Japan um, uh, is really looking towards you, honoring you not only for, for different, different things on your progressiveness. This brings me to kind of a semi-controversial question, and that is, what in the hell is wrong with the WHO? They mm -hmm. are not allowing Taiwan uh, to be part of... Uh, of uh, showing their examples that they work, and I be and I believe they feel that there's some kind of a tie to China. And so I know in March of 2020, there were some online interviews of, of the WHO and and in Taiwan that uh, they were wondering why don't you look to some of our innovations, our data, what we've experienced, how it's working for us, and uh, for some reason that I don't know if it was a minister, but he pretended like the telephone call hung up. I'm sure you're aware of that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Then again, mm -hmm. in November of 2020, uh, the same thing. It's like uh, like they don't see that the, the proof is really there in what you're practicing, that it's a better model. And so my, my question is, is there any hope that, that you'll eventually get into the WHO mm -hmm. Or that uh, are you going to kind of hack that system and bypass those so that other countries say, even if the WHO doesn't let Taiwan in, we're going to follow some of their success stories and implement those regardless? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, um, nowadays, of course, uh, we conduct most of our meetings online as we are doing right now. So um, there, of course, is uh, ways to, well, hack is maybe a okay word to use here, uh, to uh, convene uh, online meetings uh, with ministerial counterparts around the world, uh, even if it's not uh, within the official, uh, like the World Health Assembly. That said, of course, um, Taiwan's exclusion from the ministerial access of the the World Health Organization probably cost it um, many other jurisdictions at least 10 days of time uh, around a year ago uh, in January because um, you, you can see uh, we started this whole health inspection from the 1st of January but as late as the 14th of January the WHO was still saying that there's no clear evidence of human to human transmission um, which is of course uh, not what we are <laughs> rolling out right yeah, so yeah. Uh, so um, and, and what uh, what I'm trying to say is that even though we had um, and still have limited scientific access, it's very different because the scientific, even the top scientific expert that we do have access with, doesn't necessarily translate into ministerial um, actions. Uh, unless, of course, like in Taiwan, uh, where at a time our vice president is also the top epidemiologist, the authority uh, person that wrote literally the textbook on epidemiology. So so if you know all other countries have vice presidents uh, like that, then maybe scientific access is somehow equivalent to ministerial access, but it's not the case. So um, I think having ministerial access uh, would really help uh, the world. And what we are now seeing is limited scientific access, uh, which is not sufficient. Uh, and so I want to dig just a little bit deeper. I won't go too much more. But um, so on, on one side, uh, I, I, um, what I'm hearing from the WHO side is there's a, a fear of continued relations with China and Taiwan. But I want to ask you on the flip side, has China responded to how Taiwan has, has solved some of these problems and done some things and said, oh, wow, we're going to implement those. Or we're going to take the, the rule book or some of the things that Taiwan's doing. And, and you see China implementing that and seeing success from that? 
Well, uh, we did send a couple of experts from Taiwan to visit Wuhan to gather information on the outbreak and control measures implemented in Wuhan. That was in 12th of January uh, last year, or almost exactly one year ago. Um, but as uh, far as I understand, um, the bilateral um, communications and so on uh, are mostly on the scientific level. I'm not aware of any ministerial level uh, collaborations in this particular regard. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I, I really believe that you guys are a leader in, ma in many respects and, and to just kind of put the, the COVID to bed as much as possible, uh, the serious thing is, I, I, I want to ask you, I, I, w when you get the vaccine, there's now there's discussion that um, you still would need to continue to wear a mask and keep social distancing because you could be a carrier. You might not get it yourself, but you could be a carrier, which would mean that these measures um, with uh, social distancing and mask wearing would still need to continue, which is not a problem for Taiwan. They've been doing this all along. They also went back to baseball games and, and other events, uh, big concerts and events as well. Um, with minimal amount of deaths or impacts, as, as you mentioned in the beginning. As a futurist, as somebody who does social innovation and is thinking forward, how do we get into a world or what are your ideas or thoughts of moving to a world where when the next pandemic comes, when the next thing, that we're not going to the next level where we're wearing a gas mask, a spacesuit, an oxygen mask, just to interact with each other to continue business, but that uh, we, we can not return to a normal life, so to say, but a, a different life where we can still interact one with another is, do you see some innovations or some things emerging that will help in that respect, um, regardless of the vaccines? Well, in a sense, we are wearing our cameras and microphones uh, and earphones uh, at the moment, right? Uh, we are wearing them uh, and um, so that we can communicate, uh, I would argue, much more clearly than uh, if both of us are in the same room and having to wear a mask. I see you just fine, <laughs> uh, even though that we're uh, literally hours apart in terms of time zones. So um, I think the telehealth and telelearning and uh, other communication um, technologies are going to be here for, for the long run, uh, mask or not, or vaccines or not. Uh, and I personally participated in a lot of virtual reality communications uh, in the past year. Uh, I had this co-creation uh, session with the artists and curators from the New Museum uh, New York, uh, and we wore this um, XR space, which is a uh, VR uh, with no kind of wires and no controllers. I just control it using my hand and it's very lightweight. I can wear it for hours and it has a 5G built in. So there's a uh, connectivity even if I'm not indoors. So I can bring uh, my surroundings uh, to uh, PS uh, in other places to enjoy this co-presence. So uh, we had artistic creations on the top of the Matterhorn mountain uh, in Switzerland <laughs> and which is a very difficult to get to place uh, even for very healthy people. Uh, and that's uh, really really is uh, quite enlightening in terms of the overview effect uh, that we had on the globe. Uh, if you want to talk about global issues, I highly recommend to have it at a summit in VR in either a very high mountain or even in the International Space Station because it's much easier to see us as a holistic um, being uh, when you're up there as compared to uh, like trapped in a simple room. I love that. I, I speak a lot about the overview effect and that mm -hmm. cosmic perspective. I believe it's uh, it's very important. The la the last thing I want you to discuss on uh, regarding the COVID and some kind of things you have this um, have launched fast, fair, and fun. Mm -hmm. And could mm -hmm. uh, there's some interesting, beautiful things that have come out of that. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that for us? Certainly. So fast, fair and fun refers to the three pillars of social innovation when it comes to counter pandemic. Uh, the fast part I already alluded to, it's this um, advanced deployment of not just flight inspections, but also the central epidemic command center. Now the CECC is a uh, life 
press conference uh, arrangements with all the different ministries reporting to the health minister, uh, and the health minister has been uh, holding um, a lot of live uh, press conferences that respond not only to the media uh, who can ask any question and the uh, press conference only ends when they run out of questions, but also from people calling in uh, to like the toll free number 1922. Uh, and anyone can call in and get the scientific explanation. And even like last uh, April, there was a young boy who called saying, hey, you're rationing out masks, but all my classmates uh, who are boys have those blue masks but all I get is pink mask and I don't want to wear it to school. And the very next day, uh, all the medical offices in the CECC press conference were pink. And the minister even said that Pink Panther was his childhood hero or something. So the boy become the most hit boy in the class where only he has the color that the heroes wear. And the fair part pertains to the mask rationing and people can see before their own eyes uh, more than 100 different tools that shows the real time availability of medical masks and people who queue in line uh, can see when people queue before them uh, swipe their national health card actually uh, reduce by 10 every time uh, anyone swipe a national health card uh, on the real-time inventory of that particular pharmacy so people can trust each other much more uh, through this participatory accountability. Now, finally, the fun part, um, the CECC has a spokesdog. The name is uh, Zong Chai, it's a Shiba Inu. And uh, we explain social distancing uh, in terms of when you're indoor, please keep three Shiba Inus away. And when you're outdoor, keep two Shiba Inus away. And uh, remember to uh, wear a mask, but why would you wear a mask? Because the mask protects your own face against your own unwashed hands. So that's a very cute dog putting their hands to their mouth. Um, and so what I'm trying to <coughs> say here is that once the clarifications, the scientific uh, measures have a uh, more viral quality to it through humor and cute spoke stocks, uh, it tends to make sure that the uh, conspiracy theories are value will be under one, which means that it would not go viral, which is how we counter the pandemic and in the infodemic with no takedown or lockdowns. Beautiful. I, I really appreciate you going into depth. A lot of my listeners probably have never heard of that before, have never heard of the wonderful things that Taiwan is doing. Um, and so it's good to go a little bit deeper in, in, into that. Um, you obviously have, a, a br although you're still young, a very broad and long breadth of knowledge. You started when you were uh, fairly young and, and uh, also left school and did online type of your own internet MOOC type of learning and education, which was absolutely fabulous and amazing. Um, I really want to get into my hardest question for you and then, and then uh, that I have for you today, and it's the burning question, WTF, and it's not the swear word that we probably, some of us around the world have been asking uh, over, over the past year and a half, uh, it's really what's the future? I, I want you to kind of your perspective and also as a minister, what's the future? Where are we going? Mm -hmm. Um, in Taiwan, we're caught between the Eurasian plate on one side and the Philippine Sea plate on the other. And those two plates bump into each other all the time, causing endless earthquakes. Uh, so we learned to be quite resilient when it comes to earthquakes, typhoons, natural disasters, and so on. But on the other hand, it also kind of literally raises Taiwan, the top of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters high, which has broadband connection, by the way, uh, is called the Jade Mountain or Yushan, and it grows by two and a half centimeters every year, thanks to the earthquakes uh, skyward. So whenever uh, people ask me about the future, I say, well, the future of Taiwan is raising skyward. Uh, and this is where we are going, right? Instead of just uh, focusing on the left wing or the right wing, um, we just focus on the up wing. Uh, that is to say the common values, despite the different positions, quite different at time, but also the innovations that can deliver those common values uh, and leave everyone better off. Uh, and so our future is definitely uh, skyward. And I think that resonates quite well with the overview effect, the kind of cosmic direction that you are referring to, too. Ta that top of the world feeling. And I definitely sense that when I meet people from Taiwan, when I speak to you, when I've heard you in the past, it's this very positive, optimistic outlook of the future. And, and 
and really being an island, um, uh, you you are probably one of the first hit from earthquakes and typhoons and hurricanes mm-hmm. and all sorts of climate climate mm-hmm. catastrophes and crisis. And uh, you have to figure out how to have that resilience. It's beyond sustainability. You actually need to say, well, Mm -hmm. uh, we could be the most sustainable place in the world. And tomorrow a hurricane could wipe out all that sustainability. You need some resilience so that the day after or the hour after that hurricane or earthquake that you have internet, that you have uh, electricity, food, Mm -hmm. water, all those essential Mm -hmm. uh, services to communicate Mm -hmm. with the outside world. And so I love Mm -hmm. that you talk about resilience is so vital. It's measured in minutes, by the way, the minutes after the earthquake. (laughs) Yeah, minutes after the earthquake is absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and that's also was seen with your response to the the COVID and, and, uh, you know, minutes to hours and days you were already implementing thing because of upvoting. And so I, I love that. Uh, that tells me that you have a strong, resilient, and also very futuristic uh, infrastructure that, that, that you've built to make sure to prevent those things. And that kind of takes us into um, a little bit more of your social innovation of mm-hmm. Taiwan. So mm-hmm. uh, you're, you're trying to prevent dystopian narratives and stories for Taiwan mm-hmm. um, and or digital dictatorship. Um, uh, wh- whether it's the social dilemma or the Facebooks or the, you know, the fake news and all the things that we've, that we've seen bubble to the surface more and more over the years. Um, you kind of talk about code, which other people say is an algorithm. So code is basically physics. And um, you also say that, and I've heard this when, when you spoke to Yuval Noah Harari, that you really cannot break natural laws, you know, these are the, the laws of physics. And um, a code that is encrypted with biases in it is a bad algorithm or a bad code. And so what are the some of the things that are you doing moving forward to get not the opposite of dystopia into your codes, into this long-term vision of the future as part of that? Mm-hmm. the 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 upvoting or or is it much deeper is there a lot more involved in in you know keeping it unbiased mm-hmm. keeping the the fake news and those things out of it mm-hmm. yeah code uh, is malleable to coders of course uh, but to non-coders code could be as uh, non-malleable as the laws of physics, right? It determines what can happen, what cannot happen, what's transparent, what's opaque, things like that. Um, and so to non-coders, code establish a normativity that is kind of legal by design, like physics, uh, which is quite different from the uh, laws that's uh, more jurisdictional, more text-based normativity, where it's actually possible, may or may not be illegal, like um, civic disobedience and so on, depending on the interpretation. Uh, And so uh, we really need to build uh, what I call assistive intelligences uh, that make sure that the code is co-governed by the people who could be impacted by the code. And by assistive, um, I mean like my eyeglass, right? My eyeglass is aligned to me, meaning that I want to see more clearly and it helps me to see more clearly. If rather it shows a uh, advertisement that I have to count uh, from 10 in order to close it, then it's not aligned to me, uh, it's aligned to the advertisers. It's also accountable in a sense uh, of actually uh, my eyeglass just um, kind of distorted, broke a little bit a couple of days ago, and I bring it to a nearby repair shop and they did not have to pay the original manufacturer like $10 $10 billion or $10,000 uh, in licensee fees uh, before they uh, can correct uh, the eyeglasses spilled and so on. And I can even do it myself if I uh, learn about the, the craft. And so that's its um, open innovation means that anyone can fork or to repair it to make sure that it continues to be aligned. Now, this alignment and accountability when they're both governed by the social sector, then I call it a people, public, private 
limited partnership where the people sets like in the PTT, the Taiwanese uh, equivalent to Reddit, in the PTT's case, people co-set the normativity, the norms, like, for example, um, disclosing all the uh, money spent on the advertisements uh, during our elections, the campaign donation and expenditure. And the public sector ratifies and amplify that norm by essentially providing a structure open data for everyone to see the campaign donation and expenditure. And then the people and the public sector pressures uh, the private sector like Facebook, uh, who in 2019, um, Taiwan became the first jurisdiction where Facebook publishes in real time as open data all the social and political advertisement during the election and bond uh, foreign um, sponsorship of those messages during our election. And that's a norm set by the social sector and ratified by the public sector. And we negotiated the private sector's uh, conformance uh, to those norms. And so I think this uh, people-public-private partnerships has uh, a lot uh, going uh, to make previously authoritarian intelligences more assistive in a sense of citizens' direct control. I, I love that. And, and, and so you've used the term as well, transcultural republic mm -hmm. of citizens. That's right. Uh, um, and, and that's what you've really d described there. And I, mm -hmm. I think that is so beautiful that we have that kind of uh, openness or that you do have that because you're setting an example uh, a sandbox for the world so to say of what works and and, and it's a, it's a bigger test bed that has proven on uh, 23 and a half million people and it's real it's really working so I, I love the way you describe that um I want to move into uh, another area it's similar to the burning question but it's um, <clears throat> more whether it's AI or this um, um, singularity. What mm -hmm. does a world that works for everyone look mm -hmm. like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's literally my job description. So I might as well read my job description, Pl uh, which responds to the singularity issue. And it goes like this. Uh, when we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. So the plurality, uh, as you alluded to in the Transcultural Republic of Citizens, says that um, it's quite natural to have 17, actually. <laughs> I think it's the same badge as you're, you're wearing, yes, the yes. same pin. Uh, and uh, more than 17, really, are uh, different values. Uh, but they all work uh, with each other if we can listen as skill. If we cannot listen as skill, then naturally people see it as more zero-sum um, competitions where only one vision get to dominate, and that's the singularity worldview. But if we can listen as skill, then all the 17 values can work with one another. And so uh, we can realize the transcultural republic uh, with all the citizens. Uh, and this part of my pin says, Taiwan can help, by the way. <laughs> and so I love it. Uh, yeah, so it's global goals and Taiwan can help. I love it. It's absolutely beautiful. So I've seen you wear your SDG shirt. I've seen you wear that SDG pin before. I've heard you speak about the SDGs. Uh, we, we've actually spoken uh, virtually at some of the conference, same conferences o over the years together. Um, one of them was Odyssey Connect, I think was the last one that we spoke together. You were, uh, you tell, tell a videoed in and uh, it was a beautiful, uh, a beautiful talk. I absolutely loved it. But I, I want you to, to tell us a little bit more because you actually go real deep in the SDGs. You go into the targets and the indicators, mm -hmm. uh, especially with uh, number 17. But, but with the others, uh, to me, that tells me that you also feel that the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals are a goal, a roadmap, a plan for the future to get us to tw a different 2030 and I'd like to know you as minister, but also as Taiwan and what your thoughts and feelings are about the SDGs and how you're implementing them, how people should see them and view them. I'd love to hear that. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we have six municipalities and three of them already, uh, with more coming, have filed uh, the Voluntary Local Reviews, or VLRs, um, that describe their contributions uh, to the SDGs. So if you're interested in that, you can check out si.socialinnovation.taiwan, that's T-A-I-W-A-N, that G-O-V, the T-W, and you can download all the three uh, and coming more uh, municipalities' voluntary local reviews. Reviews. So you can see this is a communication device that is not just about the national level governments, but also how the local municipalities reorient their work to communicate across the different sectors. For previously, uh, without the emphasis on the SDGs, the economic development, the social uh, development and justice, and the environmental sustainability tend to be seen as silos, uh, where each bureau talk mostly to the stakeholders related uh, to those different aspects. But nowadays, uh, with the national focus on, for example, circular economy, I can share saying, hey, you see this jacket is made out of recycled plastic uh, bottles and coffee bean wastes. That is to say, uh, this cup probably <laughs> that contributes one to one tenth uh, of this jacket. And this uh, is obviously something that's more sustainable um, environment wise, but it's also pretty good business because it's upcycling and also works with uh, social cohesion. Um, there's many fashion designers in Taiwan that now uh, works with people who would otherwise uh, be very difficult to get employment, uh, but get um, into a kind of sewing uh, of these recycled, upcycled um, um, fashion clothes and even sign their name and how many hours they put into it. And so this is what I call a mutual accountability or in SDG terms um, 1718, that's in availability of reliable data. And once this is enhanced and everyone can be accountable to everyone else across sectors and that in turn encourage effective partnership that's 1717 and the Taiwan can help part says that we're happy to publish all this uh, without any string attached and that's knowledge sharing and open innovation which is 176 I absolutely love that and so for our discussion today and my audio listeners won't be able to see this but this is a, a, a coat uh, made in Bangkok, Thailand by Yano Designs. It's also upcycled with recycled materials, hand sewn, handcrafted. Um, and uh, so I know you wear a lot of those type of mm -hmm. those uh, um, outfits and products and, and try to really act upon those. So I wore this uh, beautiful uh, piece for you today as well to show that uh, we're very much aligned. I really really am so glad that we had this time and we had to push it back a few times because uh, of your parliamentary uh, meetings and, and uh, that, that you were doing so we had to push it back I was worried that we might not get to do it but it, it fell right at the right time so um, the, what happened in the U.S. at the Capitol was a, a way not to do it a way that things can go horribly wrong and you probably not one-to-one -one had the same experience in 2014, but that is the way to do it the right way, the way to do it so that there's an outcome, uh, a bipartisan outcome, an outcome that's better for democracy. Um, and, and I want to touch upon that before, before we go, mm -hmm. a little bit about democracy, because the maps, the, the borders, the global citizenry that we hear and talk about, is much different in the digital world, the digital divide sometimes we say, because, uh, and we're even talking about, you know, we need some digital delegates, some digital ambassadors, and, uh, and you're a prime example of that, because our digital world is, is forming new boundaries, new maps that are not, not the ones that we're used to. And so, I, I want to, to kind of ask, what is the future, this digital world, this digital democracy that we see for the future, and one that's positive for us all, that kind of gets rid of uh, the bad and negative things that we're seeing going on around the world and have seen with Brexit and, and the Trump vote as well? 
Yeah, what we're seeing uh, in Taiwan is that all the four major parties uh, in our parliament have signed on the Open Parliament uh, Initiative. So that's uh, in conjunction with the National Action Plan on Open Government we're also doing in our administration. So there's an extremely uh, strong, like uh, I call it, uh, quite partisan, right? All four parties uh, consensus uh, on the democracy being not just once every two or four years, but something that you can deepen uh, every day. And so uh, the answer to your question, I think, is this idea that democracy is a technology. Many people see democracy as kind of a fixed set of rules that we just um, kind of uh, practice ritualistically. But the fact is that uh, democracy is applied social science. Uh, we can apply new voting methods, right? Uh, the ranked choices, and nowadays in presidential hackathon for the past couple of years, we use quadratic voting. A lot of uh, inventions that has proven its merit on, for example, the Ethereum community uh, can be actually taken into our day-to-day -day governance. So I would say that so-called on-chain governance, right? Digital governance is one of the prototypes uh, that we can see the democracy itself uh, being being uh, forked uh, by a lot of different innovators and merged uh, into uh, management of rough consensus and running code, something that the internet government has always been demonstrating. But now uh, people are seeing it's not just about worldwide communication, which was the original issue internet was set to com uh, complete, but rather also about, as we talk about today, pandemic management, infodemic management, climate change, and pretty much anything in the sustainable development goals that will require this planetary and beyond uh, communication infrastructure that shapes democracy itself as a technology. So I would say if you see democracy itself as a technology and you shape the technology to be an assistive one, meaning it's aligned to citizens and it's accountable to citizens, then that's a very optimistic future. And even in the more authoritarian counterparts, AI still doesn't enslave people. People enslave people through AI. So we, we can actually see democracy itself as something that is more assistive, more conductive uh, to solving those global issues. And that is a vision that I'm happy to work with pretty much any homo sapiens. I absolutely love that. And you're someone who really empowers homo sapiens um, of, of all genders. You really um, hit it on the head well where you say that uh, all the sustainable development goals are systemic, they're a system, they're tied together, there's no way to take the siloed approach and just take one and just address that without touching on the others because they're all um, they're all a system tied together, but they all cross connect in one way or the other, not w whether it's the targets or the indicators, but it is a true system. And I love how you really do that in, in many different ways as a person, but as well as the digital minister. And I thank you for that. The last three questions I have for you are really for um, even more so for my audience, the younger audience and those who are the techno nerds, the singularity nerds, the ones who really uh, uh, want to follow your lead or your example on what you've done in the past. Uh, if there was one message that you could depart to our listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, it's the message that I just shared that democracy like well, semiconductor or really any open source project, democracy is a technology and it's our job to improve that technology. What should young innovators in your field, whether it's becoming a minister, getting in parliament, getting into politics or in technology or using technology as a tool, uh, be looking at for ways to make a real impact on their world. I think uh, empowering people who are closer to the pain uh, is the way to go. So talk to anyone who are currently suffering uh, and find out how you can bring technology to the people rather than to ask people to adapt to technology. You, you're a very um, quick learner and you started uh, at a very young age with uh, several abilities, um, but and a lot of it is the journey as well. You've had a journey and I've even seen, uh, followed you over time and seen that, that development, but what have you experienced or learned in this journey so far that you would have loved to know for the start? They say, wow, 
if I would have known that back then, you know, uh, or had a little bit more foresight, I would have done it differently. Is there anything? No, uh, I think uh, this is not my personal journey, right? It's just the journey of uh, first the free software movement and later on forked uh, into the open source movement, which are now merging back. Um, and this is also the story about open access, about open science, open innovation, of all sort of participatory accountability mechanisms and much more. And so this is not about one particular lesson or another to one particular person, but just about this idea that all the journeys, even though it may diverge, it will eventually converge uh, when you hold these shared values across different positions um, in mind. So I, I've known that from the start, so I wouldn't uh, say anything uh, to my younger self. Thank you so much, Audrey. It's been a sheer pleasure. That's all my questions. If there's anything else you'd like to add, this is the time. Otherwise, I wish you a wonderful evening, and I hope we can see each other very soon again and in person or at an event. I'd love to have uh, see and speak to you again. Yeah, definitely. And my uh, parting message is, as always, uh, live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. Thank you so much, Audrey. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.